Hi, I'm Jory Desjardins, and welcome to part three of our Pinterest Masterclass. With me uh, in conversation is Bob Gilbreth, who is the co-founder of Ahology, the full services optimization technology around Pinterest. And we are going to shift gears slightly and look at it, uh, Pinterest, from not just the brand perspective, but from the pinner perspective. We have here with us uh, power pinner, Jill <laughs> Nystel of One Good Thing by Jilly. Here's a, just an image of her blog. For those of you who are not familiar with her blog, she looks at one thing a day, whether it's an idea or a product, something that catches her eye and writes yep. about it. And um, it seems to have worked pretty well for you, Jill, because <laughs> you seem well. to have a nice Pinterest following, about 230,000 at mm -hmm. this point yep. followers. Yes. Lovely. All Probably very well point. earned. And I was not one of the people <laughs> and that organic, they suggested. And organic, like to point out. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so thank you for joining us. My pleasure. And um, I know that some of our pinners in the audience had plenty of questions for you, but I'm just going to dig in a little bit. Um, so I come at this as a blogger. I consider myself a blogging native. And then when Pinterest came out, I, it was perplexing to me to try to figure out how I could possibly create something that could be pinned. I came at it from more of a consumer perspective. Mm -hmm. I needed something. I went to Pinterest to go look for inspiration. But you were a Pinterest native. You started roughly around the same yes. time that you were blogging, right? Yes. I think Pinterest started about the same time I started my blog. And so it was just a natural, I just went into it and just embraced it wholeheartedly from day one. Well, and that, I find that interesting because I would imagine then that when you blog, you think about how you pin. Is that right? Definitely. I mean, it, in a way, it, it does uh, affect your creative process of what you're going to blog about. Although I like to think that, you know, what I blog about is still what it interests me. But you do have that in the back of your mind because it's such a powerful traffic driver to your website that you'd be silly not to think about that when you're creating content. So then walk us through a day in the life of Jill where, you know, you're oh, thinking about, scary. okay, I'm going <laughs> to write my blog post. How do you think about it in terms of what you're going to pin later? Well, you definitely, obviously, as Bob talked about, is the images. You know, you really want to make sure, and my images have come a long way <laughs> from when I first started. I was using my Android phone to take photos. Um, I'm still not a great photographer, but I honestly don't think they have to be, you know, professional type um, pictures. But you need to know, you know, what is going to work well as the vertical versus the horizontal. Because as you can see on my um, website, the very first image is a horizontal image. So I always have to make sure and use a different image than that one on Pinterest because it's not Pinterest That's right. friendly. Right, right. You have a nice landscape, yeah. and mm -hmm. here you need to to adjust for it. Yeah. And so, what things have you found? I mean, when we look here at your page, it's just gorgeous. Thank Do you, you find, though, that certain images tend to pop more, or certain categories tend to pop more? Uh, categories, definitely. Um, when it's something that grabs your attention, like it's something useful, just something like, I could go in my kitchen right now and do that, I could make that, that will just go crazy. Um, but but also people are going on there looking. I, I think of it as my Google. You know, it's my new Google because if I want to do something or plan something, I go to Pinterest. I don't go to Google. It's like Bob said, if I'm looking to buy something, you know, specific, I might go and see, you know, what's on Google. But um, so I'll look at it that way and, and get gather good ideas. But if if I'm just looking, you know, recreationally on Pinterest, I want those things that grab your attention and think, I can do that, you know, that's very useful to me right now and I could, I could do it very quickly, then that's what tends to get people going. So as a content developer, what runs the show, the blog or Pinterest? Uh, definitely the blog. Uh, the blog is first and I agree with Bob in that content is king. You just want good content that is useful to people and that's how I started. I didn't want to um, pigeonhole myself into just food or just this or, or just that. I wanted to be able to go to whatever interested me. And so as long as it's something that interests me and I think is um, a good idea, um, then, that, then I look at that idea and see how I can best portray it on Pinterest. But it starts with the blog and it starts with the content. So when you started getting traction on Pinterest, how did you take it to the next level? You started to notice you're yes. getting a few people that yes. are following yes. you, and then what did you do to keep growing that platform? Um, a lot of uh, what I do is um, very pinnable. So I think it is, you know, what, what you do. 
um, food. Obviously, I do a little bit of food. I do gluten-free because my son has celiacs, and so and that's very hot now. And and so if you see something that works, then you think, hmm, maybe I'll do that again. <laughs> there are some categories I still try to figure out, like the nail boards, and there you know there's certain things and categories and subcategories, just like in the blogosphere that exist yes. that you really have to just understand. Yeah, and and like I said, if you hit on something, then then go with it. Um, I found that if I pinned bright ideas, just just things that are, like I said, useful and, and people can do, people go crazy for that. They, they will repin them like crazy. And when I, um, I talk about, I did frozen yogurt dots um, when I very first started and people went crazy for it. <laughs> I mean, it was just unbelievable. And so I did a few more frozen yogurt type things and those went really well too. So build upon, you know, what you see people react to. And or, you don't have to understand it. Sometimes nope. you just have to go with it, yep. right? Yep. That's exactly. really fascinating. That happens to me a lot because I honestly I'll think, oh, this one's going to get pinned like crazy. It does. It just kind of goes. And then you think you just throw something out there and it takes off and you have no idea. Well, Bob, maybe you can do an analysis yeah. and start to <laughs> I need explain your why yeah. yogurt is really. Do you notice that there are key words, Bob, that, that when you're just noticing for, for clients that there are key words that people are tending to look up? Yeah, I mean, it, think of it again as, and I think Jill had the great point of, you, thinking of Pinterest as your audience as well. Um, great content, but Pinterest is how I'm gonna get people clicking to it. And so sometimes adding a, a title over an image can work. It's got a tease, teasing kind of words that feel almost like an article, five great ideas, you know, anything that's mm -hmm. five tips or five ways or 11 of this. You know, those are things that again, get people's eye, uh, breaks out of the comment box a little bit. And you know, Thinking of Pinterest even as the, the the user as well is she's busy. She's got a lot of things to do. Doesn't have time for checking RSS feeds or going back to a website again and again. It becomes the filter. So making sure that you're fitting well within that filter to get the traffic. So video is super hot on blogs. How is it on Pinterest? Video is tough. Uh, yeah. You know, we we don't have you know the pins don't move. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's really hard to kind of see what's going on. I think. It, you can pin video, it's certainly possible, uh, but it, it's difficult just getting, you know, again, it's, it's the medium. You know, you think about, yes, it's possible, well, what's really gonna work? Uh, now, taking 10 screen grabs from a video that's something that people might wanna see, five tips and it's a video form mm -hmm. and we're gonna take images, stills, and pin them over a series of days, that's a great way to make video work. But just hitting the upload button and having one image with a play button over it just dies uh, very quickly in terms of repins. I think you're safe if you um, do what you like. Um, and I, I'm one that won't click on a video. So I know, so I don't do it because I know that I wouldn't click on it. But it, it is different with everyone. But I think you're safe in going what you're passionate about. And then you'll find other people who are passionate about that too. And that's the people you want anyway coming sure. to your blog because they'll keep coming back. So you were kind enough this summer to join us at Blog Her 13, mm -hmm. and you shared your secret sauce with us. Yes. And I asked if you could bring some of those tips with us today, sure. and you kindly did. So let's talk about those a little bit. Um, one I think Bob would definitely agree with because you do that for your clients as well, and that's set a schedule. Yes. Uh, I do it the same way every time as far as my blog posts are concerned. I pin it right after I post it, uh, the blog, um, which is usually at one and two in the morning. <laughs> um, and then I will repin it a couple of times throughout the next day on different boards. So I, will, I have one board that's just for my blog. And so if people go to that board, they know nothing on there is from anybody else's blog. It's all, all mine and they'll see all of everything I've ever done. And then um, I will pin it on another board that is it applies to, like gluten-free or um, my frozen treat obsession. <laughs> I'm obsessed with frozen treats. And so I'll, I'll do that two or three times for the blog. And then just pinning in general, I try to do twice a day. I'll try to do it in the morning and in the evening. And it's, I don't know. Five to ten sounds really like not very many to me. <laughs> I'm a well. I, I know that I you recommended pinning. more even for yes, I mean, yeah, certainly for brands when they get yeah. a momentum going. Mm -hmm. And you talk about repinning, and I know that from the content creator standpoint, repinning to your same board is just sort of a uh, of a lesser experience for the user. At least that's what I'm told by right. by power pinners. Um, but Bob, what do you for a brand? Is that the same? Um, can a brand can a brand repin content to their same board? Sure, I mean, uh, about every six weeks or so, we can recycle a pin, mm -hmm. is what we recommend. Uh, again, because it is challenging sometimes to get enough content. 
Uh, the, the awesome thing, and just the same idea, of, and we do this as well, is pinning the same thing to multiple boards. Mm -hmm. Works, and it's smart, uh, as Jill mentioned. Knowing that, you know, again, we, we, we think sometimes as well, everyone already saw that email, or everyone already saw it. Most people still don't see it. Right. So, different day, even right. some people will repin the same thing because they forgot that they pinned it to begin with. And maybe eventually they'll it make worked. it or buy it. Yeah, so. And there's so many pins going up on Pinterest, you can't possibly see all of them, even in your feed, even if you just follow not that many people. There's just so many. So, I don't think you run the risk of people getting tired of those pins. So another thing that you had advised is watching your percentages, which sounds fascinating to me. Can you describe what you mean? It's kind of what we're talking about in that you don't want to just pin your own stuff. You know, you don't want to just pin your brand, and I consider myself a brand. So I try to keep it in a percentage. You know, I don't like tally it on a piece of paper, but I kind of keep in my mind 20% of my stuff. 20% of my new stuff and some of my old stuff. And a good way to um, pin stuff that you've done in the past is to look at your stream. So if it's uh, Pinterest.com slash One Good Thing by Jilly, that's my website, it'll show what everyone else is pinning at mine. And it will remind me, oh yeah, I did that a long time ago. I should repin that. <laughs> right? And so that's a good way to f find. And then I try to do 40% instructional and 40% just pretty, you know, just like I things I like. Her official recommendation. Yes. 40% kind of pretty. <laughs> kind of pretty stuff. Just like catches my eye and yes. I like. But the point is it's not all about you and it's right. not all about your content. You don't want it you're to able be all to about you. yeah. And I think that's how you really grow your followers too is, is that, be a curator. Yes, you're curating and you're following other people and promoting their things and then their followers see your stuff and it's all from, that a, from a brand perspective, Bob, if we look at percentages and brands I keep talking to brands who say, we just don't have enough content, or they think they have content and it's not enough. And do you have a recommendation for original content versus content they may already have or content that they're using from others to repin? Yeah, I think um, you know, overall we see a mix somewhere around, to be honest, it's an easy answer, but 50-50. You know, ideally, we have 50% of the content is owned by a brand, but 50% is tapping into the best of what's already out there. So, you know, a brand may have its own ideas or recipes, but being able to tap into someone like Jill, who's been doing this you know, for right. years and has great stuff and proven and done all the hard work to know what works and what doesn't, uh, you know, it's one of the, the, the benefits that we can bring together is, hey, we've got the best of content, it's already proven, we've got data on it, and it fits your brand. So I think that, that mix is really useful. Absolutely. Uh, you talk about pin placement. Tell me more about that. Which is a little bit of a misnomer. What I'm talking about when I talk about pin placement is where your boards are. So you showed that first picture and showed all my boards. You want to focus um, the ones you really want people to go to on your first line of boards or second line in the middle. That's where people are going to be attracted to. So obviously you want your blog um, board there, right there in the middle. And then we talked about holidays. What I do is I'll have um, like a couple months ago, I put Halloween, my Halloween board, way up high. And then when Halloween's over, I put it way down low. Right, right. So I move them around. So it's optimization of. Makes sense. People just keep pinning and don't think about where it all goes at the end. Exactly. Uh, also, use your secret boards, you say. Can you tell us what a secret board is? A couple of months ago, maybe even more, um, Pinterest started um, giving you secret boards. And you can only have three, which I think is a jip because I'd like more. I have to, someday <laughs> I would love to ask them why. Yeah, only three. I, I, that's a really, I'm sure there's a reason behind it. I don't know. I'd like to know. Um, and I use them for a few different things. I use one, I call it my to do list, and I pin things there that have inspired me about something I might want to do on my blog. So um, I see something like, hmm, I can kind of work with that and do something else. But you know, I don't want to necessarily repin it because I'm like, I'm going to do something with that. So I keep that on my secret board. And then I am a big um, fan of essential oils, and my sisters are too. And so we have created our own secret board for essential oil ideas that we might blog about in the future, et cetera. And then um, a like third your incubator, your yeah, content yeah. incubator is exactly. your secret board. Incubator, that's a good way. And then the third one is I'm actually working with a client right now. Um, uh, coming up with some party ideas, and we created a, a secret board to to both pin to um, ideas for this party that's coming up. 
so we can both see it, but not necessarily everybody so else. So more of a functional use Very functional, for you than yeah. necessarily for your audience. Right. It's not something like I'm trying to keep this secret from you. I don't want you guys to know my passion for <laughs> frozen <laughs> food. <laughs> and then you say collaborate. Yes. So are you collaborating? Um, I, through blogger conferences, I've met the most amazing bloggers and um, the ones that I really click with and that I've become friends with, I just, I will tend to pin their stuff more, you know, because I, I know them and then it's been beneficial for both of us because then their followers see my stuff and my fault, you know, and vice versa. And so I really think collaboration versus competition in blogging is so much more helpful and yet the blogging world is, is pretty you know, competitive. So. That's kind of my mantra is collaboration helps us all a lot more than competition. And it helps you become more of an expert in an area where you may not be yet, but you can start to exactly. pull in that expertise, yeah, right? Similar to what we tell the brands all the time, which is if you collaborate, obviously collaborate with someone who already knows their, right. the topic and who has already generated that that sort of a following. Makes yeah. perfect sense, exactly. right? Exactly, exactly. So I'll, I'll do a lot of things with the food bloggers because I don't do a whole lot of food um, on mine. So that's been a good collaboration. So I'm digging into some of the questions we have from our audience members. Um, uh, I have a question here from Nami from Just One Cookbook. And she asks, uh, does having text on the images increase the click-through rate? Well, I'll tell you, <laughs> yeah, data, I data think wise, both perspective. And, and Jill, I'm not sure if you tried this or not, but uh, it can be, it, you know, again, everything is, you know, there, there's, there's lines there and too much or too little, but we see some great results with adding text overlays to an image. Uh, often it, you know, again, taking that small amount of type that's in the, the pin description really hard, people don't see it, but something, again, that's a really quick kind of tease over an image. Uh, again, it's not just, you know, and certain things uh, do better, but an image alone often doesn't tell you what's there. Mm -hmm. So you can take something, we've, we've got some clients that are, we're pinning fitness uh, content, and just a picture of a woman running, you know, doesn't really get many repins or clicks, but if you had, you know, three ways to uh, get more exercise before, you know, school or something that's just interesting and clever uh, about the article that's beyond that, it can, it can get uh, something that's an otherwise boring picture to work. Exactly, and I would agree. If, it's, if, it's, if your blog post is about something that, you know, the picture doesn't really tell the story of what the blog post is about, that's where text is really helpful. It can look like I can has cheeseburger if you are not careful. <laughs> yeah. That's why I keep thinking like yeah. it'll start to look a little you know, billboard. Yeah, and but yeah. I, I I get frustrated with the the blogs or bloggers that put it on every image that they do. I think it ne needs to be used judiciously. And some may even use it as a signature, but it's got to be on a case by True. case. I would mm -hmm. say, like from a brand perspective, it probably is more of a turn off if you really overuse. Yes, can yeah, be. as anything can be. Sarah Price from uh, Google, which I think we asked your question was it, it was about video. Am I right? Yeah. Okay, we asked Sarah's question, and you did pretty much weigh in that video is is tough, but not impossible. Right. Okay. I have a question here from my partner Lisa Stone who, uh, oh, she asks, does this usual celebrity angle help or hurt on Pinterest? Hmm. I don't have any celebrities on does my Kim blog. Does Kim Kardashian yeah. have a board? I should ask. I, <laughs> you know, usual do celebrity boards? The, uh... <laughs> As a person who uses Pinterest a lot, I don't see that much. I mean, I don't. I, I Would you a... be interested in a celebrity board? Everything I like. I don't think I follow any celebrities on Pinterest. Well, you are a celebrity on Pinterest, <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. so. Yeah, well, the celebrities on Pinterest are the ones who are curating, creating great content. Yes. I mean, I think that's why, uh, you know, you're not, you, I, there's been a couple attempts here and there, uh, but no celebrity is taking off on Pinterest like maybe they have on Twitter. Because it is about, you, you're subscribing to the stuff that someone's sharing. Uh, you're not subscribing to what's up in that celebrity's life. That that's probably better right. on Facebook and Twitter. I think a good example. The only one I can think of that's a good example is Lauren Conrad. She's on, she has a lot of pins on Pinterest mm -hmm. because she has good content on her website. She does. Mm -hmm. And is it her stuff? Yeah. Because I know she she has product. Yes. Yes. But it, she has good um, actual tips and 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 ideas. Like yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good to know. Mm -hmm. So uh, here's a question from my other partner, Lisa Camelhart Page, who asks about commerce in Pinterest. Now we know that Pinterest actually tried to install commerce into its functionality, which I think 
a lot of people were not too happy about and then other companies said, great, we'll do it. <laughs> but what do you think is the future of it? And do you think that it's a smart idea for, for Pinterest to make, say, images linkable? Or what would be the right way for Pinterest to engage in commerce? This is more of an opinion question. What do you think, Jill, as a power user, what would be that? Um, I, I, lo I love that Pinterest is all about curating what you're passionate about. And I really think that that's how it should stay. Um, I think um, sales and, and those things will happen naturally if you are um, pinning good content and creating good content and putting it on Pinterest. I think that's all going to happen naturally. But if you're kind of forcing the issue as far as making it more commercial, I just don't, I don't see that as working on Pinterest, personally. And, and I think it's, uh, you know, eventually Pinterest will have to, it will have a business model. Uh, yeah, right. And we're, we're uh, awaiting to see what happens there, I think, though. At the end of the day, because it's about adding value, as Jill said, I think there's some great opportunities for Pinterest to way to, to find those win-win-wins where it's great content, people seeing it, brands being an added value part of that. I think uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to see what, what comes out in the, in the months ahead. And I think, I think Blogger is brilliant at that in that you bring brands together with bloggers and you do creative ways of getting that product across without Thank it you being very much. obvious. <laughs> Thank you very much. Well, hopefully through our partnership with Ology, we'll continue Perfect. to do that. And what a wonderful segue. Thank you very much, Jill, for doing my job <laughs> for me. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for joining us here today for your wonderful questions. I want to thank Bob for joining us and Jill. And I would love to thank Creative Live for providing us with this fabulous space to, uh, to have our master class. Thank you all.